Hello and happy new year, everyone. Uh, 2021 has brought some hope to the tens of thousands of Oregonians who faced a benefits cliff with the expiration of the CARES Act, to the many others who will soon be receiving additional benefits, and to all of us here at the Employment Department as we continue our hard work to get critical benefits out to those in need. Last week, we shared a lot of information about the benefit programs passed under the Continued Assistance Act. Perhaps the most exciting of those updates was the confirmation we received from the U.S. Department of Labor uh, that claimants would not lose out on a week of PUA, PEUC, or FPUC benefits, as well as our hope to begin uh, paying some of those benefits as early as this week. Today, I'm so excited to share that thanks to the swift and hard work of our IT, unemployment insurance, and other teams, we've been able to implement some changes and start paying some benefits without any gap or disruption to the people relying on them. About 72,000 people faced a potential abrupt loss of benefits with the expiration of the CARES Act. As of yesterday morning, about 59,000 of those people who had weeks remaining on their PUA and PEUC claims were issued benefit payments for the week ending January 2nd without interruption. While most eligible PUA and PEUC claimants received their benefits for last week without any interruption, we hope to issue payments for others through this week and next. We're also excited to share that we have already started paying the $300 weekly FPUC benefit. As of yesterday morning, we had paid over $36.5 million to about 122,000 people under this program. As long as people receive at least $1 in weekly benefits, they get the additional $300 benefits each week through the duration of this program. I want to thank the Employment Department staff for working so hard, even over the holidays, so we could get these benefits out the door and into the hands of the people needing them. We are incredibly relieved that the legislation was passed and that Oregonians are not losing their lifeline as abruptly as we would fear they, as abruptly as we feared that they would, but I wanna be transparent about the immense work that the employment department is facing. I've shared several times that extensions of existing programs were much preferred over the creation of several new ones, but the work required to implement those program changes is still significant. And to be clear, we're committed to making these program changes to building the new optional program with urgency because, because we know how much Oregon families need us to do this. While we've begun paying out some benefits under the Continued Assistance Act, we have also started to receive written guidance from the Department of Labor for some, but not all, of the program changes created under that federal law. It's vital that we don't move preemptively forward with some changes until we receive the federal guidance. We want to make sure we share accurate information with Oregonians and that we implement the correct programming and other changes in order to get everyone all of the benefits that they're eligible for. We're joining several informational calls with the Department of Labor this week. And once our UI experts have been able to interpret that information and the written guidance we receive, we'll be making that information easier to understand and we'll share it with the public. We anticipate continuing to receive guidance over the coming weeks and hope we'll soon be able to provide some rough estimates for when we expect to implement the remaining required program changes and when people waiting on other types of benefits can expect to receive them. We've also been working with the governor's office to identify new opportunities created by the Continued Assistance Act for us to help Oregonians. We're suspending the requirement to wait 13 weeks to turn extended benefits back on after a period where a falling unemployment rate turns those EB benefits off. Currently, once extended benefits have stopped being available because of an improving state unemployment rate, it can't start again until 13 weeks have passed no matter how high the state unemployment rate becomes. Suspending this rule is something that will uh, ensure Oregonians do not lose the essential benefits they're relying on due to a short-term improvement in our unemployment rate. And this change is something made possible by the recent federal legislation. Additionally, we have the governor's support and direction to waive the waiting week beyond the current statutory date. So the waiting week will continue to be waived through March 13th of 2021. Both of these actions expand benefit opportunities for Oregonians as a result of the recent federal legislation and bring in additional, additional federal funds for those benefits. Before moving on to other updates, I do wanna highlight the biggest takeaways from today. The Oregon Employment Department has begun paying the extra $300 FPUC benefit 
and most of those who face a benefits cliff with the expiration of the CARES Act are already receiving their PUA and PEUC benefits without interruption. And I do also want to remind people to continue filing their weekly claims as normal, regardless of which program they're in. This is the quickest way for them to resume or continue getting benefits. For people who uh, were claiming PUA or PEUC who still had weeks left on their claim, but haven't yet seen their benefits, we're working hard on those claims and are hoping to issue payments by next week. For people whose PUA or other claims didn't have any remaining funds available to them, or for people filing their first PUA claim, know that you will receive all the funds due to you retroactively. Please make sure to keep filing for benefits each week. With so many changes to our programs, we have seen some minor issues to our online claim system, and these are promptly brought to our attention and our employees have worked hard to address these issues. These changes have also brought very high call volume with lots of people having questions about the new programs and the changes to existing programs, particularly as this comes at the same time as the UI quarter change and the workload peaks that we normally see this time of year. We know people have many questions about these programs and are anxious to know what this means for their claims. In an effort to keep the phone wait times reasonable for people who have to speak with us in order to get their benefits, we ask people to please search our website first. We're updating that with the most recent guidance and information we get from the US Department of Labor or search our, our social media pages to see if you can find the information that's being looked for and to submit any inquiries to us using the contact us form. We will be holding an unemployment insurance webinar focused on the new federal programs, uh, and that will be at 1 p.m. this Thursday, January 7th. While we're still waiting for more details from the Department of Labor, such as information on new requirements, what information people may need to provide us for the new programs, we know how important it is to share what information we do know as soon as we learn it. The webinar this week will be simultaneously interpreted into simplified Chinese, Russian, Vietnamese, and Spanish, and people can register to join that webinar at unemployment.organ.gov slash webinars. And anybody who would like to watch a recording of the webinar can find it on our website and our social media channel shortly after the webinar is completed. We've been recording our progress against a September 30th snapshot of the number of people whose claims we knew needed adjudication. The goal for this focus adjudication was to uh, resolve those 52,000 people's claims, that, and we hope to do that by the end of 2020. As of this week of that 52,000, there are fewer than 150 remaining. We're in the final week of this initiative, having completed over 99.7% of those claims. We want to thank Oregonians for their patience as our team rapidly hired and trained adjudicators to focus on getting through this workload. It's taken an intense effort by our adjudication employees and others, including the help of the National Guard, to get to this point, and I'm very thankful for their dedication. Standing up all these new and changed programs will not slow down our adjudication work. As we complete focus adjudication and shift our resources to the other cases that need adjudication, we will do so with the same focused attention so Oregonians can get the answers and benefits that they've been waiting for. With the waiting week payments, we have paid nearly 98% of all eligible waiting weeks on track with our original goal to pay the vast majority by the end of January, 2021. We've paid about $290 million to about 425,000 people. There are about 9,000 claims still waiting to have the waiting week paid out. These are among the most complicated situations that require much more manual work to address and sometimes requires us to get additional information from the people who have filed the claims. Getting these payments out is a priority and we'll continue pushing towards our goal to complete the majority of these by the end of January. So far from March 15th of 2020 through January 5th of 2021, the Oregon Employment Department has paid out about $6.7 billion in benefits. We've received about 619,600 claims for regular unemployment insurance benefits during that time period. If you look at the same time period a year ago, that was about 111,700 claims being filed. 
We continue to do well on the processing of initial unemployment insurance claims. For the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance or PUA program, we have paid out benefits uh, totaling about $497 million to about 92,100 people. Our work share program continues to see high usage with over 1,700 businesses participating and that represents over 67,000 workers. I wanna thank you again for joining us today and for helping us to distribute important information to Oregonians, particularly as these new programs get rolled out. Even though many people have started to receive their benefits, there are some who are still waiting because we're still waiting on guidance from the US Department of Labor to make sure we can program these new benefit programs correctly. We're committed to working quickly to implement these program changes and to get people the benefits they desperately need and to continue sharing information and updates as soon as we're able. And with that, I'm happy to try to answer any questions that people may have. Now I'm opening the lines to members of the media to ask questions. Um, I will call on you in the order that you RSVP. Reminder, if you're joining us by phone, please hit star six to unmute yourself. And if you can't get your question in, please email it to oed underscore communications at oregon.gov. First, we have Angelina Dixon with KVAL. Angelina Dixon with KVAL. Okay, let's try Lindsay Nadrich with. Hi, David. Um, I was just wondering if you could tell me how many more people outside of focus adjudication are waiting for their claims to be adjudicated. I heard from a guy today who's in that situation. He's filled out the contact us form twice and still has heard nothing back. He's getting a little frustrated. How many people are in that situation and what would you say to him? In terms of what I'd say, I would say that we're certainly sympathetic and we are doing everything we can to resolve all of those claims as quickly as we can. Uh, it, and we are reaching out to people. We're working through those at a faster pace than we ever have before. I mentioned that when we took that snapshot for focus adjudication at that point in time, there were about 52,000 people whose claims needed adjudication. Uh, the most recent figures I've seen, which are within a day of the total number of claims that we know of that need adjudication, it's about 13,000. So we've not just worked through a lot of the people who had been waiting the longest amount of time. We're getting much more current. We're working through the more recently discovered issues and the more recently filed claims much more quickly. And we're dedicated to continuing to get more and more quick at reaching out to people and either paying them their benefits or giving them the information they need to understand why they may not be eligible. And then just to clarify for folks reading questions on, you know, do I need to do anything extra to get the $300 weekly benefit or keep going with my claim? Um, at this point, you haven't received any new guidance that people need to be doing anything differently, correct? For, for the additional $300, they do not need to do anything different. They should just keep filing as they have been we need to determine whether they're eligible for any payment under another benefit program, whether that's regular UI or pandemic unemployment assistance or any of the extensions. And if they are eligible and they receive a payment under another program for one of the covered weeks, they will automatically get that additional $300 payment as well. Thank you. Thanks, Lindsay. Next is Bill Poehler with the Statesman Journal. Yeah, hi, David. Um, do we know how many people received the $300 additional payment in this week's of unemployment benefits? So as of yesterday, it was about 122,000 people. Uh, and we know that some more have been paid since then. I don't have the uh, an update in front of me more recent than what we had as of yesterday morning. Sure. Sure. Um, I'm kind of curious. The, can you tell us about the the process that the department went through to to get all these and all these new these new programs essentially came in really quick because it was signed into law December 27th. Can you tell us what 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 the processes were and what the department had to go through to be able to actually pay all this stuff? Sure. Uh, and it has been a lot of work and a lot of teams working together really hard, uh, pretty much continuously since it looked like that law might come into effect. So we have our IT experts who are looking at the coding to look at um, 
where we can take advantage of the prior programs that were made, where changes might need to be made, uh, and starting to, to map out how to do that technical coding work, finding people to do it and to do the testing. That's being done in conjunction with our unemployment insurance team. And they're having to read through the federal statutes uh, to compare that to what we already have implemented, look at Oregon law, um, start mapping out where things are pretty straightforward and we can take action quickly and don't need to wait on guidance. What some of the big questions are that we know need to be answered before we can complete programs. And then there's a lot of constant work of uh, trying to estimate how long it will take to be able to pay the benefits out and having people just jump into doing that, uh, write guidance for our employees, train our employees, get communication out to the public. Uh, it, we're a much more agile agency now. It, it's a lot of the same work that had to be done when the pandemic first started and the CARES Act passed, uh, but we've, we've evolved quite a bit and we're handling it much more adeptly. And I think our ability to get so many people their benefits with no pause at all uh, is a testament to the dedication and expertise of our employees. Great, thanks, David. Thanks, Bill. Next, we have Peter Wong with Pamela. Hi, David, thanks. Uh, picking up on Bill's question, I shudder to ask this question, but uh, March 13 isn't that far away. Uh, and uh, I don't know what Congress is planning since obviously the composition of Congress has uh, changed uh, with uh, today's elections. Uh, and uh, is the department prepared to <laughs> improve on its agility, uh, 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 assuming that Congress uh, does some further extension or alterations to the uh, unemployment compensation? So, so we certainly have that on our mind. Right now, we're pretty focused on implementing all the new changes, uh, but we, we are in close communication with our federal delegation, certainly from Oregon, with the National Association of State Workforce Agencies and the U.S. Department of Labor. As we're making changes, we are keeping in mind what possible future changes we think are likely. That's one of the things that allowed some of these benefits to get uh, rolled out so quickly this time, is the people that designed and implemented the program before we're planning ahead and thinking of what some types of changes might be so that it could be done more quickly. So we're, um, I think we're continuing to evolve is how we do this and continuing to get even more agile. Uh, we're gonna be focused pretty heavily on getting these rolled out, waiting to see how the guidance comes out on the remaining parts of the new programs. And then I'm sure that there'll be ongoing discussions and, and hopefully much more in advance than the March 13th deadline so that if there are any further programs or uh, new programs, changes to programs, we'll have more time and might even be able to start working on them before the prior act expires instead of having to wait until it's expired to start implementing them. Okay. Uh, the other question I have is, uh, is there any simple way to describe some of the other changes the Department of Labor guidance is gonna help you with? or? I think in one previous call, you said they are tightening some fraud protections, but I I don't recall that you actually said that or whatever. So I, I just want to see if there's any simple description of that, of those changes. I, I can give a simple description of some of them. Um, and one is that the new federal legislation does require states to do identity verification. Oregon uh, already does a number of identity verification techniques. So we don't know that the guidance when it comes out will require us to do anything different, but that's a possibility. So that's one of the things that we're waiting for. For people who have been receiving PUA benefits, anybody who receives a PUA benefit from December 27th or later, the new federal law requires that there be some documentation provided by that person to show that they were self-employed or about to be self-employed. And we're waiting for guidance on the Department of Labor about what type of documentation is required or where we might have flexibility to determine what is needed or where we can get that information. So that there's, that those are probably two of the easiest to describe ones that have some pretty big impacts in terms of what we'll have to do. There are probably at least a dozen other areas where it gets very technical, but for, um, although it may impact a smaller number of people for each of those technical situations, it's vitally important for each of those person. It can impact which benefit program they can go to 
um, whether they're able in some cases to continue receiving benefits even after March 13th for a period of time. So there still are a number of outstanding questions that we're working on. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Peter. Next is Mike Rogaway with the Oregonian. No questions today, thanks. Okay, next we have Kate Davidson with the OPB. Hey, um, just a quick question. Sorry if you addressed this last week, but for people who were in that sort of time period where um, as the programs were expiring, went on, went from PEUC to extended benefits, would they now have to go back or be able to go back to PEUC and then go back to extended benefits? How does that work for people in that subgroup? This is where it does get very complicated with people that were switching between the different extension programs. Um, and and we're, we just received some guidance today on some of those issues and we'll be putting that out publicly. Um, it, and it can depend whether they were on PEUC going to extended benefits. We also have people that might've been on PEUC, PEUC that couldn't get extended benefits that were going on to PUA. And those get handled a little, a little differently. In some cases they will, um, continue to receive benefits under the program that they were on, for instance, extended benefits until those are used up. And then they would go back to the um, newly available additional PEUC benefits. Uh, for some people that went to PUA, they uh, do need to be moved from PUA back to PEUC. This is another area where we're waiting for guidance. The federal law gives the US Department of Labor some discretion to tell states how much time they have to move people from PUA back to PEUC, because that will take a fair amount of manual work uh, for all the states to do that work. We don't yet know what that time frame is. Um, of the 72,000 people, um, the vast majority you said began now to be paid this week, PEUC or PUA. What distinguishes the people who were paid from the people who weren't? What, what are the characteristics of that group of people um, that hasn't been paid yet that makes them more difficult to pay? Probably the, the major distinguishing factors, if people were right at the end of their claim, uh, so they were about to exhaust one benefit program and move on to another, because of the issues we were just talking about where it can be complicated as to whether they just can continue getting new benefits under the old program or if they need to go to a new program. Um, those are seeing a delay, uh, adding the additional weeks of benefits to an existing program does take additional IT work to implement those changes. Uh, there's also a number of claims where, uh, in many cases for reasons unrelated to the expiration of the CARES Act, uh, something came up on their claim where we need to get additional information from them. So those are certainly in that category where, uh, you know, they would have not been able to get benefits without the new federal legislation. They are now able to get them, but for some unrelated reason, um, maybe we need to get some additional information to validate their identity or to make sure that they were eligible for that particular week. Those are probably the biggest categories. And I'm sorry to ask question 2.5, but just going back to the extensions for a minute, as you get more guidance about switching people between the extension programs, is that something people would need to take action on or would you switch them automatically? It, it will depend. For some of the changes, uh, we will be able to do that ourselves and where we can, we'll do that. There are some types of changes where it looks like the federal law may require there to be either an application or some additional documentation from the person. Uh, so once we get the guidance on that, we'll certainly be sharing that. And probably the best place is uh, on our website where we'll be posting that and trying to push that information out to everyone as quickly as we get those answers. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Kate. Next, next. Sorry, that's my dog. <laughs> I think you, uh, this is Dick, I th am I correct that you called for me? Yes, thanks Dick. Okay, uh, yeah, my dog's asleep, so I can s sneak this <laughs> this question in. Um, David, you've been very good at explaining things and I apologize uh, for my confusion and uncertainty, but I understand people should just keep applying 
filing their weekly claims. I'm presuming that some people will be running out of weeks fairly soon if they started filing back in March. Do we know whether they are automatically extended by this new legislation? So the, the answer is that for some people, we know that they will be extended. Uh, for some of them, it should be transparent and automatic. For other situations, it will require manual work on our part. And this is where for some of those people, we may need to get some additional information from them. But we know that for all of those people, a minimum requirement is that they're, they're going to have to file for the week. And that's why it's so important for them to keep filing the weekly claim because for a lot of people, there won't be any extra steps and either it will automatically result in them getting them, in them getting their benefits, or it will allow our employees to go through and do the work we need to without having to uh, get in touch with them or ask for anything further. Where there is a need to get additional information, we'll at least have that weekly claim and we'll be able to follow up with people once the federal government tells us what additional steps are needed and explain to those people what else they need to do to get the additional weeks. That they're really, as these new programs get created and get a little more nuanced and get layered on top of each other, there are just more and more scenarios and types of situations that come into play. So it, it's unfortunately getting harder to give uh, one, two, or even three answers that really will apply to most people. And that's why we're trying to to gather as much information and break it out as helpfully as we can to the individual scenarios that we're going to run into. Thank you. So if, if people still have questions, what we should be telling them is go ahead and keep filing no matter what, and you're not doing anything or wrong or illegal by continuing to, cl to claim file claims every week. I, absolutely. Um, claiming a week just means that they're, they're saying that they want to receive benefits for that week. If they claim the week and they provide accurate information, that, that, that's never a problem. Um, absolute worst case scenario is we would tell them that unfortunately you're not eligible for any benefits. Uh, and if they disagree, they have an opportunity to challenge that decision. But, but that's exactly what they should be doing. If, if they think they might be eligible for benefits for those weeks, they should go ahead and file. That's the, the quickest thing for them, and it makes it quickest for us to help get them their benefits. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dick. Next, we have Tom Kisak with Oregon Housing Blog. Tom Kisak with Oregon Housing Blog. Okay, next, let's go to Amber Rodriguez with KTVL. No questions today, thank you. Okay, and um, lastly, we have Keaton Thomas with K2. Hey, David, I hope you're well. Um, I just wanna go back to adjudication. You mentioned that there are roughly, I think you said 13,000 that need adjudication right now. My understanding is that there are also other claims that may need it and may not be actively being adjudicated right now. So I guess, can you tell me how long does it typically take to adjudicate a claim and how long or versus how long are people expected to wait right now for you guys to finish the adjudication process? So it, it, a couple of comments. Um, this certainly isn't a typical time and it hasn't been for close to a year now. So. Um, in normal times, the federal requirements are that states try to resolve most claims within 21 days of when they realize there's something that needs to be adjudicated. Um, and sometimes we, we get information when the claim is first filed. Sometimes we don't get that information until much later, but th that's the, the federal standard is to try to resolve them within 21 days of when the, the issue is identified. Um, that's not something that has been possible so far during the pandemic, and we are pushing really hard to get to that point and well beyond it as quickly as we can. Right now, we're not quite there. We do have a number of issues that get resolved in under 21 days. Um, for some, it is taking longer. We, we've shared publicly in the past, um, at, at one point, it was we were estimating about 12 to 16 weeks. Um, we've been getting more and more current. The, the one of the 
good problems that we're having now. Um, it's a challenge we've had all along of providing estimates is that things are changing so quickly that it's hard to give an accurate estimate for how long people today should be waiting because we're still constantly changing our processes to make ongoing improvements. Right now, we're really seeing the quick uh, benefits of that and we're getting through the work much more quickly. So one of the things that we're, we're able to talk about is the number of claims waiting uh, that we know need adjudication. We're continuing to look for other ways to try to, to measure that. Um, but in terms of the wait time, it, it, it still varies quite a bit. Uh, we're focused on getting to where we're resolving um, a large majority of all those claims uh, in under three weeks. And, and then my follow-up is ultimately, I understand that it probably won't happen tomorrow and probably won't even happen end of this month or next month, but at what point and what would it take for OED to be fully caught up to meet that 21 day time period? And, and when we talk about being caught up within the employment department, we're talking about not just adjudication, it, it's really every part of the process because there are a lot of parts. It's people filing new claims, finding out if they're eligible or not and under which program and how much they can receive. It's uh, receiving the weekly claims, it's moving people from one program to another, it's doing the adjudication. Um, there's a number of, of types of things that, that we're committed to being current on, and that includes being able to have people get through on the telephones quickly and to get any inquiries responded to very quickly through the Contact Us form. Um, we're continuing to make progress. It's still really hard to give a date as to when we can say, you know, we're, we're at the customer service levels that, that we want to be at. Um, we're going to be pushing for months because, frankly, even some of the federal federally required customer service levels um, aren't where we want to rest. Um, we do think that we'll be seeing significant improvement and um, for the adjudication issues where there is a kind of a concrete federal measure, um, we're working to, to be at that three week or less mark as quickly as we can. It, it won't be this week, it, it won't be this month, um, but we hope that shortly after that, we'll be able to, to share that we are meeting that standard. And, and just one, if you don't mind, um, in the past you've shared that adjudication was the biggest challenge within the department, is that still the case? Or, or with these uh, extended federal programs and potential for new ones later on, what is the biggest challenge for you guys right now? Well, it's an interesting question. I think the huge progress that we've made on adjudication means that it, it, it is much less of a standout because we have made so much progress, we're, we're speeding quickly towards being more timely. Um, it makes it a little more hard to say what the biggest challenge is because we now have a whole lot of smaller challenges that we've been working on all along. Um, implementing the new programs is certainly one and the, the large bodies of manual work that have to go on behind the scenes to move people from one program to another to do the testing um, and working to get ready to, to help people as the economy does reopen, helping them find jobs. So. I, I would be hard pressed on the spot to come up with what the biggest challenge is. Um, we're moving on several fronts at once. And uh, I, I think that's another area where we've become more agile and able to do that more effectively. Great, thank you so much.